Hello and welcome to today's Decarbonizing the West initiative webinar. My name is Abby. I'm a policy advisor at the Western Governors Association, and I thank you all for joining us today to participate in this discussion on carbon transport infrastructure. Decarbonizing the West is WGA's 2024 chair initiative under Wyoming Governor Mark Gordon, examining how decarbonization strategies like carbon capture, utilization, and storage, direct air capture, and enhanced natural sequestration can position Western states to be leaders in innovation and carbon emissions reduction. WGA launched this initiative in June of last year, and since then, we have run a pretty rigorous stakeholder engagement process through surveys and a regional workshop series um, and webinars to identify best practices and develop policy recommendations. In the coming months, we will be publishing these findings and recommendations in a report, which will then be used to inform Western Governor's future policy and advocacy efforts. We will be releasing this report this summer uh, in conjunction with our annual meeting, uh, June 10th through 12th in Olympic Valley, California. Um, if you're interested in revisiting some of these previous workshops um, and webinar discussions, those resources are available on the WGA website, and I would encourage you to check some of those out. Um, before we get into today's discussion, I would like to take a moment and recognize our initiative partners listed at the beginning of this webinar, uh, including Basin Electric Power Cooperative, Google Energy, Idaho National Lab, J.P. Morgan Chase, NetPower, Tri-State and the Walton Family Foundation. Their continued support has made much of this work possible and we're grateful. Uh, all right, throughout the initiative, we have explored many different aspects of carbon management and carbon removal. And from CCUS to direct air capture, a lack of transport infrastructure acts as a common barrier for deploying these technologies at a meaningful scale. Pipelines remain one of the cheapest and most efficient ways to transport CO2 for geologic storage, but these pipelines can come with some significant challenges. Addressing these challenges to enable the scale up of CO2 transport, whether through permitting processes or financial mechanisms, can help unlock opportunities for carbon removal, storage, and utilization at a greater scale. On today's webinar, you'll get to hear more about some of these challenges for developing carbon transport infrastructure projects and some of the policy and investment opportunities that may be transformative in deploying this infrastructure and create enabling economies of scale. Today, it's my pleasure to be joined by Skylar Borglum, Vice President of Underground Storage Markets at WSP, and Terry Warren, Senior Consultant with the Department of Energy Loan Program Office. Um, I'll turn it over to our lovely speakers in a second. Um, if you have questions for our speakers at the webinar, feel free to drop them into the Q&A box and we will do our best to get through them uh, throughout the webinar. Um, to kick things off, I will hand it over to Skylar to talk about some of the work WSP is doing and uh, I think uh, I'll let you share your screen here. Okay, well, hello everyone and good to see you. Um, like, uh, like Abby said, I am Skylar Borglum and I am here to talk about effectively pipelines and why we need them. So this is, uh, this is a little bit, uh, adjacent to the work that I do. I am an underground storage market leader. I, my background is petroleum and geological engineering and I really quite honestly enjoy all of the work that I am involved in. It's been everything from natural gas to hydrogen to liquid petroleum gas. And now we have um, now we have carbon dioxide sequestration. So with that, let me pull up my screen and I will um, I will share. Let's see here. My. Let's see, I think I'm just I'm not sharing. Oh, here we go. Let me try this. Okay, did that come up yet? Stop sharing. Let me try resharing for the. So, okay, first glitch. That's all right. Um, it's my my slides are not coming up on the share option. Um, so I'll have Abby pull those up, and while she's while she's getting that moved forward, I will talk a little bit about what we do as a company. So as I mentioned. 
I'm in the underground storage group and we are about 125 people plus or minus on any given day. Um, we have a massive company, which you'll see, but the energy group is really known for, um, in my, in my line of work for underground storage. So one of the questions that we are always asked and that we are in conversation with our clients about is, are you looking for permanent or temporary storage? And with this increase in temporary storage, or excuse me, permanent storage that we're seeing with carbon dioxide, we're in fact seeing a huge uptick, not only in permitting, but also in geologic feasibility studies, which we do, site screenings, which we do, and of course, bringing all of the pieces together because everything with CCUS, as you know, it's a, it's a continuum. You have the producer of, this, of the carbon dioxide, you have the capture portion, the transport is what we're talking about today, and then of course the um, the the storage, which is what which is mostly what I focus on. But thank you, Abby. Okay, next next slide for this. So I'll talk a little bit about WSP USA, what we do, and just a tiny bit about underground storage, and then our cavern storage options and considerations. And that's just so we understand why, when we're having these conversations about pipelines and transport why we are looking at uh, at what we what we need because you have to know that what your end is before you can build your your pipeline to get there so next slide please WSP I like to I like to brag on my company we are about 70,000 people worldwide and we are the number one consulting firm for science and engineering. I love that about my company. We are not just a run of the mill consulting company. We have the best scientists and engineers that are in private industry. We have 550 offices around the globe and we are in 40 countries. We might even be in more than that now. Our end goal is to plan, design, manage, and engineer long-lasting and impactful projects worldwide, and that includes carbon capture and sequestration projects. Next slide. So of all the things that we do, and we cover all major forms of infrastructure, I am in the energy section, and the energy business line includes not only underground storage and what we'll talk about today, but also power and power generation. So whether you are looking for solar, whether you are looking for wind turbine, offshore wind, um, anything along those lines, we can certainly do in our energy group. And then additionally, we have advisory services, property and buildings, transportation and infrastructure, program management, and water and environment. So a very robust group of people to get, um, to get your project off and running. Next slide. This is a, just a very brief history. I won't go through, through each piece, but I like to show this one because it shows the longevity of our group in particular. The company itself is 125 years old and the underground storage group actually got started with the Strategic Petroleum Reserve back in 1977. So carrying this forward, we are closing in on on our 47th year of doing business in the underground world. And this is just a, a remarkable and very long history because we have people in our group who have done 30 years, 35 years worth of work. Next slide. All right, so this is this and the next slide will be the last two that, that we talk about in terms of underground storage. But most people in America don't realize how much of our energy is stored and where it is located. Overwhelmingly, we have our salt caverns in the American Gulf Coast. And then those are the domal salt caverns. For the bedded salts, we have those working their way up more along the Rocky Mountains. And then, of course, over in the Ohio, Michigan, and West Virginia area. We also do hard rock caverns. We do leaching plants, gas compressor stations, brine disposal wells, industrial disposal, and acid gas disposal. And just for the benefit of the group, acid gas disposal is uh, very, very similar to CO2 sequestration. And not only, um, not only is it CO2 that we're injecting into the ground, but we're also using the same, uh, the same protective measures. And now it turns out we may be able to use 
the same permit. So whether it's a class two permit with those monitoring and observation wells or a class six permit, you, um, you should be able to go after the bulk of those credits, if not all of them. So very exciting work. And then one more slide, Abby, and I think that's it. Okay, I had asked Abby ahead of time if we covered in a prior series, in a, in, in a prior seminar episode, what the underground storage options are. I wanted to point this out for, for the benefit of the audience, whether you have the depleted fields, which are the leftmost column, or the depleted aquifers, and those are saline aquifers. Those We don't store anything in freshwater aquifers. Whether you're storing in the oil and gas fields or the depleted aquifers, that would be your permanent storage and and that's a very safe area to put your put your permanent co2 sequestration you likely would not store co2 in a salt formation and the reason being salt is intended to be for temporary use and so you would want to be able to withdraw and re-inject and withdraw and inject so um, i just wanted to make sure that we were all on the same starting page because these domal salt caverns in particular are a very valuable asset and and so they also are fewer around the country so whether you're in the texas louisiana gulf coast region or not will determine whether you have access and then of course if you're looking to store co2 you have more options uh, which you saw on a previous slide with the with the um the remainder of the United States and depleted oil and gas. So with that, I think that's the last slide that I have for, for our work in underground storage. Yep. And so I'll talk about pipelines, but I wanted when we get to that part of it, but I just wanted to make sure that we were all on a level playing field when it comes to where are we going to put the CO2? So thank you, Abby. Great, thanks, Skylar. Uh, I'll hand it over to Harry for his opening remarks. Um, if you wanna share your screen, Harry. Okay, let me try to do that. So let's go for this and that. And we'll see how that looks. Everything looking good on your end there? Perfect. Great, great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Abby, and uh, thanks for uh, letting me join the uh, the group here. Um, again, uh, Harry Warren. I'm with. I'm a senior consultant, a contractor with the uh, DOE Loan Programs Office. I've been there almost three years now, almost from the beginning of the real ramp up of our efforts that took place uh, in 2021. Uh, what I'm going to do real briefly is I'm going to go over the the loan programs that we operate that are sort of especially relevant uh, potentially to uh, carbon capture uh, transportation, carbon transportation projects. Uh, and then, um, and then uh, give you a little bit of the, the magnitude of what we do, some of the specific programs that are involved, and then I'll look forward to drilling in uh, uh, some more during the Q&A. Uh, so let's see. Uh, for those of you who might not be familiar with us at a very high level, um, we are, we are, as our name would imply, we are a lender. We're a loan office. So we, we provide very attractive uh, debt financing to large uh, energy infrastructure projects, uh, typically projects that are at least $100 million uh, in size. And in fact, the average loan that we're working with right now that we're processing through our office is on the order of a billion dollars. So we're dealing with very, very large energy projects. We have tens of billions of dollars of loan authority, which I'll go over in a few minutes, across a diverse set of programs and project categories. We not only focus on things related to carbon capture and, and sequestration and utilization, but a very broad range of, uh, of energy technologies. And as the quote from our director, uh, Jigger Shah, kind of notes on the left, where we really think we have the most impact is when we're dealing with uh, projects and technologies that are mature, that are ready for large scale, that are ready for big financing, but maybe the view of the markets is they're not quite mature enough to be ready for the kind of attractively priced debt that we can provide through our various funding vehicles. Um, I mentioned that we're dealing with a, a we've, we've, we're dealing with a lot of projects right now. We have over 200 applications across all the technology areas that are currently moving through our office. 
uh, that, at, that represent 245 different sites around the country. And I put some little stars out for, uh, for you so that you can see that the, the areas covered by the Western Governors Association uh, are responsible for, it's actually nearly 60% of the project locations that we're dealing with are in the states that are within your, uh, your area of interest there in the Western US. So very well represented in the portfolio we're dealing with today. Um, this bar chart shows a, a breakdown of our loan programs in, in five different uh, groupings. The two bar, the two largest bars on the left of your screen are under what we call our Title 17 authorities. These are authorities which have been around since 2005 when the office was founded, but under the Infrastructure Bill and the Inflation Reduction Act, our authorities under those two areas have gotten uh, increased significantly. The middle bar is the only one that's really not relevant to our discussion. It's about uh, vehicle uh, transportation, uh, sort of a supply chain for electric vehicles. A lot of that is in that category. But the two smaller programs on the left, there's a tribal energy financing program that I'll touch on briefly. And then there is one that we'll probably talk about a little bit uh, in this more uh, as we go along, and that is our CO2 Transportation Infrastructure Program, or CIFIA, which is uh, another standalone program. So actually, uh, except for the green bar in the middle, I'm going to go over just a few details about each one of these programs to show you that we have many different loan authorities that we could bring to bear on not only uh, carbon pipelines, but all the related uh, uh, sequestration, use, storage, all those aspects of the technology. Under those Title 17 authorities that I mentioned, uh, on the top left, you'll see some different program categories. Uh, of course, we're the government. We have to have lots of acronyms and numbers that go with everything. So the 1703 authorities, these are some of our longest, uh, uh, longest in existence authorities that we are now calling innovative energy. This is where we're looking to bring new technologies into the marketplace at scale that really haven't been brought into the marketplace at those big scales before. Obviously, CO2 transportation, storage, capture, probably most of those projects can find a home within 1703, which is kind of our broadest program. Under 1703, we got some expanded authorities recently. We can do supply chain projects that are related to those technologies. We can do projects that under this third bullet, the CEFI category, State Energy Financing Program, projects that are receiving a material level of state funding and state support, we can come in and leverage that with our loan support as well. And finally, the Energy Infrastructure Reinvestment Program, this is a very large new authority, and this allows us to uh, do one of two things. We can either help to replace, repurpose, reuse existing energy infrastructure that has recently been or is being retired. Think power plants that might be uh, slated for retirement or just been retired. We can also make improvements to existing energy infrastructure to help reduce its pollution, its greenhouse gases. So very broad program to attack uh, all kinds of energy infrastructure related uh, projects with existing infrastructure. The CIFIA program, our CO2 transportation program, as you'll see, I've kind of bolded on the left there for you. It's That is targeted specifically at large capacity, common carrier CO2 transport projects. We're sort of talking a little bit about, about pipelines today. That program can also cover rail, shipping, and any other transportation mechanism. It's an interesting program in that it not only has a loan component under the CIFIA legislation, it also has a grant component. And there's another office within DOE that you're, many of you may be familiar with, our Office of Fossil Energy and Carbon Management. They're, administer, they're going to administer the grant side of the program. You might keep an eye out. There may be something coming in terms of a funding opportunity announcement from that program in the not too distant future. And then finally, I said I would just briefly mention our tribal energy financing program. Uh, this is specifically focused on projects that are owned by a U.S. tribal entity or owned by an entity that is, that is majority controlled and owned by a tribal authority. 
The project can be on tribal land or non-tribal land. It just has to have that ownership nexus. And that program can cover pretty much any energy project you could imagine, very broad authority to assist uh, tribal entities develop this kind of infrastructure. So somewhere across those three programs, I, I, I don't wanna to be too glib about this, but it's kind of hard to find an energy transition kind of project that can't find a home somewhere within our authorities. Uh, as long as it's a good project and a, uh, for us to do. And, and uh, my last slide is just sort of giving you a little thought about where we, the kinds of projects we're looking for and the kind of features that a project needs to have to really be ready for debt financing. Okay, you know, we, uh, we need projects that are fairly mature, you know, to really be ready for lending. So just a few things that are on this slide here. We talked about some of the project size requirements. We really do very large projects. As any lender would be interested in, are there good offtake agreements? So if you're a carbon pipeline, do you have emitters that are committed to deliver into your pipeline? Do you have a sequestration site that's ready to accept that? Where are you on your capital raises? Do you have the development capital that's needed to get through the, uh, to get the project through to where you're ready for construction? And when you get to construction, have you had conversations to get the permanent capital that will complement our debt capital? We again, technological readiness. We need things, we need projects that are ready to scale. We're not financing small pilot projects. We're taking those pilot projects to large scale. Uh, on the top right, environmental review. We'll be talking some more about that. Um, uh, we need to have projects that are, you know, understand what their environmental implications are going to be. And other things like, Obviously, site control, regulatory approvals. We'll be hearing some more about the regulatory approvals that are needed. Uh, we look for experienced management teams. When you're dealing with multi-billion dollar or multi-hundred million dollar projects, you do need a good team to be able to carry that out. And, uh, and last but not least on this list, community benefits. Uh, any funding you're getting from the Department of Energy these days, probably other government agencies as well, but certainly within DOE and the Loan Program Office, we're looking for what we call a robust community benefits plan that makes sure that jobs, environmental justice, diversity and inclusion, all the sort of aspects that we'd like to see around that project are, are part of the plan. So with that, I'll finish. That's, that's the end of my slides and I'll look forward to, uh, to answering some questions. Great, thanks Harry. And uh... Since you mentioned environmental review, uh, maybe that's a good place to start. Um, so I guess since borrowing from LPO, whether that's through CIFIA or some of the other programs that you mentioned, um, it's considered a federal action, NEPA would be required. Um, so I guess with these CO2 transport projects, considering the scale and the geographic scope, um, which is often pretty broad, um, can you maybe discuss some of those challenges of navigating some of those review processes um, and how they might impact market development and the financing aspect and um, just sort of the NEPA angle that you guys deal with? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, uh, I think the first thing I do want to note about NEPA is, uh, so remember, it's not, we're not permitting authorities under NEPA. You know, we're, uh, we're our federal action is providing a loan. We're, in our office, we're not dealing with any sort of permit type of authorization. However, we are a federal action, as you mentioned, so we need to comply with NEPA. Um, most large, pro the scale of projects that we are dealing with, if, if for those on the call that aren't familiar with the National uh, Environmental Policy Act, it actually goes back to uh, the Nixon administration, I believe, is when that uh, that law was passed. That just makes sure that federal actions are taking all environmental aspects issues into account as we're going forward. Uh, under, that, under that law, there are different levels of review that might be required depending on the scope and complexity of the project. Most of the things we do because they're large projects, they either require what is called an environmental assessment or an EA. That's a process that takes us about six to nine months to fully review, evaluate, and come up with our uh, analysis of. Uh, it ends with something called a finding of no significant impact, or FONSI, as it's called, uh, in, that, in that scope. 
The higher level of environmental review, which is often required, which can be required, is called an environmental impact statement or an EIS. That is a process that not only has a sort of an internal technical review by the agency, but it also has a lot of public input steps. Publications of notices in the Federal Register, public hearings, review of public comments and reissuing of notices and things. That can be an 18 to 24 month process. And one of the problems, one of the difficulties for pipeline projects, uh, long projects, hundreds of miles of pipelines and laterals, it's hard to conceive of these projects not requiring us to do a full environmental impact statement, a full EIS. And so working that timeline into the timeline of these pipeline projects that are trying to get into construction, they already have other significant environmental you know, permitting reviews that they need to do. Uh, that can be tricky. And so uh, my only message, I guess the concluding message on that is that's why it's important to talk to us early on in your thinking about your project. If you think you might want to work with us on some loans to make sure that we do the best we can to figure out what level of environmental review is going to be needed and how can we start as early as possible to mesh this in with your schedule? Yeah. And I think in that vein of just the length of time that it can take to build out some of these projects, even before, you know, you put shovels into the ground, it can take many months to years to get sort of the front end approvals. Um, but recently in the past couple of years, CEQ suggested that the FAST 41 framework could potentially be used to provide guidance and clarification um, and some clearer timelines for the overall CCUS permitting process, um, which could in turn has led CCUS projects to be uh, become available under the FAST 41 framework. Um, so I guess, Skylar, for you, what are some of the other available policy mechanisms that could be used or implemented um, to expedite some of these permitting timelines that are stuck in the queue? Is FAST 41 the answer? Are there other opportunities out there? That's a that's a really important question because as, as everybody in the energy industry is feeling right now, the permitting process is painfully slow and frustrating. And it doesn't matter if you're an oil and gas company, it doesn't matter if you're a midstream company or a pipeline company or a wind turbine company or a solar panel, it, like it doesn't matter. Everybody in the energy industry, which includes includes all of us is, is feeling that frustration. I think the FAST 41 certainly could be an option. We have to be careful in our enthusiasm that we that we don't end up creating more bureaucracy that we have to combat when we're trying to get, when we're trying to minimize it. I am acutely aware of the importance of having those environmental assessments and environmental impact statements that Harry mentioned. And the reason why we have permits is because we want due diligence. We want to know that the T's have been crossed and the I's have been dotted. I was visiting with, uh, with some colleagues of mine in our pipeline group just today and and ask, could you give just give me a, an understanding of what are we talking about when we're when we're talking about permits? One pipeline just going across the state of North Dakota, and North Dakota is a pipeline friendly state, required between 50 and 60 permits because whether you're going under a road, okay, well that's one, but what kind of road is it? Is it a state road? Is it a county road? Is it a um, is it a dirt road? Uh, are you going underwater? Well, then that's the Army Corps of Engineers. And so you have just a stunning number of permits that these pipeline companies, look, they're accustomed to this. They're, they're used to it. They know how it works. But as we know, it's also prohibitive for any smaller group or a new entrant into the market. We've seen new entrants in the market make some pretty significant missteps in their communication with their communities. So, so for me, the policy levers that should be used is what can we strip away from all of the actors, right? Whether it's CCUS pipelines, which I think are critical if we're serious about decarbonizing in this country, this is, this is non-negotiable. We need CO2 pipelines. And then um, that also will make it easier for other energy entrants into the market. And, and the reason I bring this up is because 
In the United States, we are running to stand still. We use approximately 80% of our energy mix as fossil fuels. This is not going away. This is not going to change for the next 100 years while we're in this process of adding to our mix because everything we add is, is getting used up. So we can't, we can't just excise one whole group and say, we're not going to use you anymore when we don't have the permits in place. We don't have the technology. We don't have the, the um, frankly, the human infrastructure to put all of this in place. So, so for policy mechanisms, I would, I would argue we need to, we need to take a good hard look at what is not effective, what's slowing us down beyond doing our due diligence and, and the last piece I would say, and we can talk about this more in, in future questions, but I'm so passionate about this subject. What, when we get opposition to a project, how many, of, how many of those people are from the area where it is taking place? And I recently saw an analysis of, of, frust, of um, how do I want to say this, objections to the classics permit, the EPA primacy permit in Louisiana, a stunning number of the objections and text messages were from New York State. So I would like to see at least a weighted review, if not a, a flat out dismissal of, look, the people who are going to be impacted by this project, the people who are living here, the people who, who work here, they have the right and should be able to comment during that public comment section, which is part of our permitting process. But if your project is in Louisiana, objections from New York State should get pretty well dismissed because New York State doesn't have a vested interest in what's going on in Louisiana. That needs to be up to Louisianans. So I think I think that would be something, and I've seen this in South Dakota, which is where I live, you have people who come from out of state to lodge their complaints. And even if they show up in person, um, if they're not from here, then, okay, they can have their say, but it's not going to, it's not going to have an impact on the outcome. So those would be a couple of pieces that I would say right off the bat would clear out a lot of a clear out a lot of the backlog. Yeah. Well, and I, can I just, can I just chime in a bit on your, since you mentioned the fast 41 process, you know, that that is something we've seen a couple of our of our projects, uh, our applicants using the Fast 41, you know, uh, approach. Just um, when you're working with us at LPO, uh, my understanding of Fast 41 is it gives you as the as, uh, as somebody looking for who has multiple federal agencies that you're trying to deal with. Right. It allows you to sort of get a clearinghouse. I think you sort of get a, a point of contact to try to coordinate those different agencies um, and as as uh, Skyler was pointing out, in these types of pipeline projects, you may be engaging with the Army Corps of Engineers if you have river crossings. Out west, you may be engaging a lot with the Bureau of Land Management yep. on exactly. on their on their things. And if you're getting a loan from LPO, you're dealing with us. I would say this: when you are dealing with LPO, it's it is often typical because because our interest is the entire project, whatever it is. We're often then the ones that take the lead coordination role on with respect to the other agencies. So we'll try to coordinate with the Army Corps, with the Bureau of Land Management. If it's a very if if our interest is sort of bigger geographically than anyone else's, we'll sort of come in. Our team is actually pretty good at moving things along on a time pace that's pretty consistent with what Fast 41 was designed to accomplish. So I would just say um, maybe a little sales feature for dealing with LPO. We're really good at coordinating with all those, all those other agencies, uh, you know, to make that happen. And just one other thought, you know, Skylar was mentioning a number of the different permitting challenges. I do think just to be clear, Fast 41, some of these things I've been talking about, these are like federal authorities and, and that are covered underneath it. There's the whole layer of state issues and potentially local issues that get involved. I think what we've seen in some of the really big long distance CO2 pipeline projects that are crossing multiple states, right? That, that seems to have be, be arising as a real challenge, right? You may get permits and authorities out of one state or another state, but there's one state somewhere along the path that might be uh, hanging you up. So that's, I don't, 
I mean, that's just, the, I think as someone who's dealt a lot with state regulation and is like, hey, it is what it is. You know, you have state regulators and they all have their their different uh, requirements that they have and, and interests that they have to serve. So that's something that that's clearly, uh, you know, difficult for long distance pipelines. But we're pretty, I think on the federal stuff, we can stay well coordinated. Yeah, and I think that coordination aspect certainly becomes amplified as the DOE begins to encourage and incentivize these stack hubs and hydrogen hubs and really mm -hmm. um, promote regional, sort of regional scale infrastructure. Um, so I guess, is there, do you have any thoughts on how to navigate that large coordination effort that can take involve multiple states, multiple federal agencies, multiple state agencies, um, swaths of stakeholders and, and communities in different areas. Um, I guess what's, do you have any recommendations or ideas of how to wrap your hand, our arms around that at the front end? Is that Skyler for Gary? Take that one. Oh. <laughs> I'll let Skylar take that one. Nice. Um, <laughs> this is, this is, from from my experience, Abby, and that's a fantastic question. This is one of those challenges where you need just enough people mm -hmm. and not a person more, right? Because you get you get six people in a room and you can really make things happen. You start getting eight, 10, 12, and suddenly you just get bogged down in the sheer sheer weight of all of it. And and like Harry said, if you can find someone at the federal level that's willing to be the, your point person and help you drive it forward, that's invaluable. And then you would need someone simultaneously or a couple of someones to work on those different states um, and with state agencies. I know depending on the company, you may rely on your government relations team like we do, certainly at WSP. We have a we have a fantastic government relations team who have relationships at all levels and all different um, all different states. So it's really your project manager has to be on their game, paying attention and and the driving force coordinating all of this because all of these projects are a priority to their respective owners, but not necessarily every project is a priority to everybody who touches it. And that's that. there's nothing profound in what I just said, except that as somebody who has had to drive projects and paperwork and forms forward, um, it's it's exhausting, it's mentally exhausting. The other, the other thing I will say is earlier is always better. Um, you never know if a form, right, you think you filled out a form correctly and maybe maybe something changed, maybe the form was updated and you weren't aware of it. These are just some of those, those little headache issues that can frankly hang you up when really what you need to be focusing on is that community engagement. So working with professionals to handle to handle those different, like you said, just wrap your arms around it, right? There's so much detail to be covered. And then that's only one part of it. The other part, and I named my little presentation at the beginning, this um, communities in converse, communities in communication, I think. And I said that on purpose because any relationship depends on communication. And our, our social license to operate in these communities depends on our communication with the people who live there. So we cannot take for granted the people who are in these communities and we're building pipelines. Pipelines are the safest way, bar none, to transfer and transport material, whether it's CO2, crude oil, natural gas, LPGs. Um, no one has died. There's been no reported death. There has been no, um, no, no deaths associated with CO2. And, and so these are, these are valuable and critical statistics to put forward into communities. But if there's only one side that's negatively um, talking against pipelines and we're not as an industry standing up and saying, actually, it's far safer to transport by pipeline than it is by vehicle or by rail, um, we're, losing, we're losing ground and, and we need to go take that back. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, uh, if I could, throw, if I could throw in another couple of thoughts there. Thanks, Skylar. Um, one is, uh, you know, th I guess there's this, there's this um, 
sort of funny old phrase, you know, we're here, we're with the federal government and we're here to help. You know? <laughs> but I will say in this regard that we've been talking about um, community engagement and sort of getting out ahead of those issues. Uh, you know, I mentioned on, on my last slide that one of the things that's required as part of any of our loan applications, and I think any DOE funding application, is this community benefits plan. And sometimes people look at that and they say, oh, that's four more things I have to do. But yeah. the flip side of that is we have within LPO, first of all, we have an excellent uh, environment, jobs and justice staff that works with people on those community benefits plans. And in fact, because of all the projects we're doing around in the country, they have been out in the community talking about a lot of things already. They're actually a fantastic resource when you're dealing with LPO to help give you ideas about how to do better community engagement and the kind of things you might want to do and some of the contacts that you can use. So it's very, actually we have some very valuable services to offer there. And in fact, I, I keep finding out as, I, as I'm with DOE longer, and I find out that there are all these other offices that are doing all these other wonderful things. You were mentioning the hub programs before, uh, Abby. Mm -hmm. Those are run by the Office of Clean Energy Demonstration, OSED. It's one of the newest entities within DOE. They've been, on those DAC hubs and hydrogen hubs, they've been doing tremendous outreach into those communities, getting engaged with people. I believe that Jennifer Granholm was down in Louisiana not too long ago talking about about some of the projects that we're doing down there. So there's a lot of engagement being done by DOE to try to lay the groundwork and the foundation for some of the community engagements uh, in those areas. And just one more unrelated thing I'd like to mention since you mentioned pipe safety as an issue. One of the things that's been floating around for a while that I believe is gonna be resolved this summer, FIMSA, which is like the pipeline uh, safety administration within the federal government, they are supposed to issue some new guidelines for CO2 yes. pipeline transport. That's, they've had some, there are certainly regulations that are out there, but I think in the wake of all of the ex expanded interest and new reasons to be transporting CO2, they're gonna be coming out with new regulations. I think that is gonna be something that will be something that therefore the community and the states can sort of look to and rely on as a new set of standards that as long as they are complied with, you know, hopefully we'll raise people's uh, feelings that the safety, that there aren't safety issues related to transportation that are, that are not well understood. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, thinking of PIMSA and how they sort of spearhead the oil and gas regulation and tying that into some of the comments that you made earlier, Skylar, um, in previous sort of conversations throughout this initiative, we've heard people mentioned that existing frameworks from the oil and gas industry and other um, sort of heavy industries that have been established could be a model for, for providing strong frameworks for carbon transport and pipeline infrastructure. Um, so I guess from your experience in that industry, are there specific elements um, that would create parity or additional opportunities for developing this infrastructure? That's, that's wonderful. Um, I, for me, and I think this goes for a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of developers. Certainty, whether you like it or not, whatever the regulation is, as long as you have certainty, then you will have investment by by organizations, by companies, by developers. It's when you have uncertainty that people and and companies are far less willing to invest because whether it's whether it's good or bad, they don't know what's coming next, and so they they can't make those long term investments. And with with pipelines, of course, and with CO two transportation, and with these projects, we're looking at 10, 12 years at a minimum, and I would argue probably much much longer. So the certainty of having a uniform regulation like FIMS is providing that, that Harry mentioned across the United States, that's the same for everyone and talks about the, what pressures you can use, your pipe thickness, the depth that you're burying your pipe, how close you can be to a community, all of the different questions that, that people want answered. If those are answered, laid out uniformly and present a level of certainty for investors, I think rather than rather than being a negative, that's a net positive because like, like we've discussed, these pipelines are crossing several states and what you don't want 
is some patchwork approach to, well, in Colorado, it's this, in Wyoming, it's this, in North Dakota, you have this. That's not what you want. You want the same thing for everybody. So it's a level playing field all across, all across the country. So in having those uh, regulations brought forward, I think it's, it's a net positive. And then the last piece I will say, um, as Harry mentioned, we had some already for gaseous CO2. And it's my understanding that these new regulations will be for critical phase CO2. The reason that's important is that it allows you to transport a much larger volume in, in less time, there's less friction. And a developer, look, developers and companies, we're in the business of, we have to make money or we don't get to be in business, right? Now we want to do things well, we want to do things safely, we want to be a good neighbor. We want to work well with the people in the communities that we're investing in, but we still have to we still have to be in the black. So in order to do that, having the smallest footprint while being able to deliver the most volume is really what's going to make these projects um, attractive to developers and investors, and and certainly to loan officers like like Harry's group, right? Because Harry's group's going to want to know that they will get paid back. That's also in their best interest. So they can continue loaning money to future projects. So I think to your question with FEMSA putting forward their their recommendations and, and uh, guidelines going forward, the companies that I'm involved with, they look at what the standard is and then they try to anticipate what the standard is even higher going forward so that they know they're doing the best the best possible work for the communities that they're involved in. And having that level of certainty will frankly make it more attractive for people to start engaging in these projects, which is really exciting. Um, question mm -hmm. from the Q&A chat here. Who will have primacy over these pipelines? States, the federal government, um, and what happens if the pipelines were cross state lines? My understanding is that pipelines that cross state lines are under federal jurisdiction. So interstate pipelines are under federal jurisdiction. And then pipelines that are contained entirely within one state, intra-state pipelines are under state jurisdiction. Yeah, I think there's some, um, if, I, if I could add to that a little bit, I think that, you know, CO2 pipelines are sort of interesting right now because FERC does not regulate CO2, these sort yeah. of sequestration CO2 transport lines. So I think that we're seeing, I think we're, we're seeing that the main permitting issue for pipelines occurring at the state levels. And as you mentioned, Skylar, you know, you have a bunch of, a bunch of different states you have to go through to get that done. The primacy issue, um, often I hear that word associated with the wells themselves the sequestration wells. And there's a, that word is used a lot in that context where the US EPA right now has the overall jurisdictional authority for the permitting of those wells, unless it is delegated down to a state through an application process, right? And that's where we have right now, we had Wyoming and North Dakota were the two states with primacy for permitting class six wells. Now, Louisiana was just added, you know, as you mentioned, Louisiana was added to that roster. I think Texas is, has applied. Texas West and Virginia. Alabama, Texas and Alabama are in a dead heat. So, no, yeah. So there's a few other states that have applied and the rest are still yes. relying on US DOE to permit the wells. The pipelines though, they're, they're kind of tricky. I don't think there's any federal preemption yet over permitting a an inter, even an interstate CO2 sequestration line. I'm not I asked it, I, it's interesting you bring that up, Harry. I asked a colleague of mine about that this morning when when Abby sent out her questions, what can we do to make it mm -hmm. easier? Mm -hmm. I was thinking, what if what if the federal government delegated authority to the different states, right? You go through the same primacy process and could you have it like a class six UIC well? And because these pipelines go across the state, it would end up making more of a headache and more of a mess than yeah. not. So it may be one of those. And, and again, this is, this is way out in, in left field, but it may be at some point these interstate pipelines get 
you know, I'm not even willing to go that far. No, <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking now. No, but the best thing, no way to stop. Right. So I'm just going to stop. <laughs> yes. Cool. Um, well, you know, circling back to that argument about just creating an enabling environment and ensuring some regulatory certainty mm. uh, to really incentivize developers and make people willing to take up some of these projects. Um, I know that's a big cornerstone of the CIFIA project, and I don't know if you, or CIFIA program, and if you wanted to maybe shed some light on how CIFIA can help it overcome some of those chicken and egg scenarios with regula mm -hmm. regulatory certainty. <laughs> well, again, I, I have to say that, you know, because we're not really a regulatory or permitting body in any sense, you know, DOE, I mean, we're in, in this respect, I mean, maybe in some other aspects of DOE, but we're, we're just a bank uh, as far <laughs> as this goes. So again, I think, I think the one area where we can contribute uh, certainly is uh, long pipelines usually do engage a few different federal agencies somewhere along the line. And so our ability to come in and help coordinate at least the federal uh, authorities and reviews that are being done to make that as efficient as possible, that's certainly a contribution that we can make. We really have, we're just rule takers and, you know, as a lender, we just need to make sure the permits are there before we start handing out money. And so we sort of are on the, we're kind of, if you will, on the same side of the table as the developers of the project saying, we just need to get these through the state the, the state processes. There is there is a little question sometimes that I've heard some app people that I talk to ask themselves, which is if they were engaged with LPO and we were undertaking our full NEPA reviews of the whole pipeline and coordinating the federal agencies, would there be any state or local authorities that might take some comfort in that? by knowing that we were doing this very broad, very expansive review, would that could that possibly help state agencies get comfort, state agencies and local agencies get comfort with the fact that there was a broad overall high level public participation and environmental review being, being done? Now, the flip side of that, of course, is that I, uh, some of those same people I've talked to said, yeah, but on the other hand, that might cause all of our state permitting to just slow down figuring they're not going to do anything until the federal government is done. So there's a little bit of a, you know, it's not really clear where that would come out, but I certainly think that the, um, the type of process that we go through and the extent of our process is one that I would hope that, you know, people would be able to feel good about the breadth and complete and completeness of that review. So maybe there's some benefit in there when you have a federal agency nexus. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. Just checking on the time here, I guess. Um, before we wrap things up, I want to give Skylar and Harry the chance to just highlight any closing thoughts, any takeaways or um, sort of ideas maybe you didn't get to share. Just that as somebody on, on this, this side of the, the work, <coughs> excuse me, we do the, <coughs> excuse me, um, we do all of it. And you know what, Harry, <coughs> I'm going to pass it to you. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I, I went and got my glass of water uh, earlier there, Skylar. Um, okay. Well, well, um, what I'd say is, um, uh, one thing about the loan programs office for any of you who have dealt with federal government financing, um, we're a very unusual office within DOE in this respect. Usually when you come to the DOE for funding, you'll see a funding opportunity announcement go out. Mm -hmm. It's got a deadline. You send in your paperwork. There's really not a lot of communication you can have with the funding agency until you get through that process and are, have been selected for negotiation. Loan Programs Office, very different. My role is to talk to people who are thinking of applying, answer all their questions, help them understand our programs, very high bandwidth discussions. And in fact, if people decide to apply, People in our business development office work with you through the entire application process to get your application in a condition where our folks can really fit properly and efficiently review it. So it's a very much more interactive discussion. I'll talk to anybody at any time about projects they're interested in talking about, uh, which again is very different than the more formal paper-based process people might be used to. So uh, 
Abby has my contact number, uh, name, and uh, just call me up. Thank you. Okay, I think I recovered Back at least a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. I love what Harry just said because what I hope everyone takes away from this, this call is that we're excited, right? We're excited whether it's the Department of Energy, whether it's whether it's WSP or or any other group out there, the Western Governors Association. We want to see this go forward and be very, very successful. So there is there is a time limit on it in terms of the tax credits that are available, but the technology is there. It's established. This has been around for over 40 years, and, and we know how to move this forward through all of the permitting processes, your pipelines, transporting it. And I think what we're going to see going forward is a collective move to optimize the process the faster we can get this done, the more efficiently we can get this done, the more everybody wins. So it is in our best interest to continually refine the way we the way we go forward. And and I, for one, am very excited because I think this is the next step function in the United States taking leadership with with collecting emissions, with with putting them down whole, putting them in a safe place and um, and not not losing her stride in terms of energy security and energy independence. Great, well, I'll just quickly wrap things up here. Um, I'd like to really sincerely thank Skylar and Harry for taking some time out of what I know to be very busy schedules to join me on today's webinar. Um, today's webinar concludes our series of events for the Decarbonizing the West initiative. So I would also like to take this moment to thank those of you who have been a part of the surveys and workshop series and webinars um, and who have contributed to our policy recommendations that we will be developing for a report. Um, I hope you will all stay engaged with Western Governors as we develop and release that report um, in the coming months and continue to work on these issues um, going forward. Thank you all so much for joining us today and I hope you have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you, Abby. Thanks, Abby. Thanks, everyone. Good to see you, Harry. Bye.